Hi, welcome back. This is the second of six sessions about the MQP 1.0 protocol. Um, this one is about connections, security, sessions, and links. Let's start with the connection. A connection is layered over a foundational transport stream. Usually that's TCP, but it could be anything that provides a reliable, um, consistent stream. So SCTP would do that, and uh, win on Windows, name pipes would do that. And uh, there's many, many, many more different um, IPC mechanisms that would also provide the same kind of streaming experience that you can go and simply layer um, an AMQP connection on top of. So AMQP is not particular about being bound to TCP. Um, the connection at the AMQP level provides you with a reliable ordered sequence of frames. Well, that's something that it takes from the underlying protocol as a requirement. Um, and also negotiates a maximum frame size. And that is, as I already said in the introduction, very important if you have constrained devices or also if you're running a super high scale system like we do in, at Microsoft, we run these hyperscale systems that support millions of connections. We can't take arbitrary large size messages. So for service bus, for instance, we constrain that frame size to 256 kilobytes um, to allow a high degree of parallelism and high degree of, um, of um, um, density um, on our system. And when you build an application that has to do with small devices, the small devices may only have only be able to handle let's 32K or even 8K of data frames. And that's something you can negotiate very easily with the MQP protocol at the connection level. And then um, all frames that are bigger than this are protocol violations and won't be accepted. The connection has the connection is being opened. That's the first fra frame that uh, flows on the connection. You create your foundational connection. You open it up um, with uh, by telling the other party what your container ID is. So it uh, communicates that back to you um, with um, the with the reply. You tell it what the host name is. That's equivalent to server name indication or the host header. A server name indication on TLS or uh, the host header in HTTP. So if there's a routing infrastructure that deals with the raw socket, but then wants to go and dispatch to particular um, hosts, you can do that um, by having that host name in there. And then also further, and I don't have all the properties here on that uh, list, also communicates that maximum frame size. It also tells you how many channels exist. And a channel is a way to have completely independent lanes effectively with different purposes on top of a connection. And uh, also, as I said in the introduction, um, MQP treats connections as precious. So connections are expensive to set up because of TLS negotiation and of uh, security context establishment, etc. So it wants to go and provide maximum um, use out of that having that connection. So these multiple lanes can uh, be for multiple quality of service or multiple um, uh, priorities. So you have a regular channel for regular traffic and then you have uh, something for alerts and express traffic and you can have those separated out by these channels. The, um, and you, those channels are being used for sessions, which is something I'm going to explain in more detail on the uh, next slide. Um, also part of uh, the connection model is uh, what happens just in, as this connection is created before that open frame is being sent. And that is the security negotiation. Um, and, um, and even before this, forgot that one, one thing, also idle management, so idle time management is also expressed here and there every party in the open frame can say, I'm going to tolerate X uh, this time um, for, of idle time and if that's not satisfied, then the other party will have to go and send a message to keep that, that connection alive, Other, otherwise the connection will drop. So if you know what your infrastructure has in terms of tolerances of idle time, then you'll send that over. If you know that you're behind a NAT and that NAT has uh, a uh, 30 second, 60 second um, idle timeout, that's information you can now tell the other side so it can go and adjust its uh, ping frame um, idle timeout to that. The security model is uh, happening kind of as a preamble to that open frame. Um, that's, and it's negotiated in uh, one of effectively three models when you want to use transport level security. Um, the, the TLS integration, so you can do, let's step one, one, one down uh, below. TLS is an optional component. You don't have to use TLS. If you use TLS, uh, if you use IPsec security, so you create IPsec tunnels, then 
TLS is optional, so you can choose whether you want to use that. Um, but uh, it's recommended and in our product, for instance, it's required to make a TLS connection. There's two foundational models to create TLS inside of AMQP. One is a single port model, you, so you connect to the default AMQP port that allows secured and unsecured traffic and you open up the conversation with a TLS preamble. And in the TLS preamble you say, I want to go and engage in a TLS session with the TLS version 1.2. The other party will then go and answer with a similar um, negotiation frame. And once those negotiation frames are exchanged, both parties go and establish a TLS connection and then start the AMQP session. So it starts effectively with an AMQP uh, negotiation header and then upgrades to TLS and then continues um, the rest of the AMQP session with SASL and then with uh, the AMQP open frame. The pure TLS model has a dedicated port 5671 and there you start with TLS that's similar to HTTPS as it's being practiced today. Um, you simply open up a TLS channel into that port and then you start with the SASL frame um, and uh, then following the AMQP open, um, AMQP version negotiation and then AMQP open. The other way to do that with TLS is there's an extension for WebSockets um, that's a draft currently in the AMQP Oasis working group. Um, we already implemented that draft um, on our side um, where you create a WebSocket over port 443, which now gives you kind of an TLS tunnel a priori, and then you start MQP over that. The SASL authentication is something that uh, the MQP working group took um, as a ready-made piece. SASL is an RFC, is an internet RFC um, that defines an extensible set of authentication mechanism and uh, MQP defines a number of frames, um, a special sub-protocol, if you will, for the SASL negotiation. So um, two, um, three interesting SASL me uh, me mechanisms that uh, are being used is anonymous. Um, the client is not authenticated. Um, so there's no, there's effectively an anonymous client that's being used and that might even happen over, T over TLS. So if you don't need to know the client, that's an option that's interesting for another security model I'm going to talk about in a different course, that's claims-based security, where the security is not happening at the connection level. So at the connection level, the flow is anonymous, but once you want, want to create links, then you place tokens for those links into the AMQP infrastructure, as I said, it's going to come in a later course. Um, and then two, the, uh, two more are external. External means you already established credentials at the TLS level. You used a certificate or used pre-shared keys or raw public keys. And now you're binding the established identities to the um, MQP connection or SASL plane, meaning you send a username and a password, a username and a passphrase key um, over to the other side and the other side goes and validates that. So that SASL mechanism will also accommodate any other SASL a method that's being negotiated depending on what the server supports, uh, the receiving party supports. And the nice thing about a a SASL is that SASL is extensible and the server can announce which of those methods it supports. So you can take the entire catalog of SASL mechanisms and leverage that with AMQP if the server and the client um, respectively support it, but the protocol supports all of them. A session. So now we have a connection. The session is being opened using uh, a begin frame. The begin frame is being sent on a channel. So it picks a channel that it has available, the sender, um, and then begins the communication. It says the remote channel here is null, so it's not prescriptive about that. It doesn't address that remote channel. It says go, tell, tells the other party, go and pick one. And the other party goes and uh, responds to this by also saying begin. And it says, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm responding to you over there, to your channel three. Um, with my channel seven, and that's kind of how that session is being formed. The session is a bi-directional thing. It provides a window-based flow control model, and uh, that is uh, defining the number of uh, total transfer frames that the sender and receiver can hold in buffers at any given time, and that's an important thing. Um, because it's a reliable protocol, MQP, it allows a, the, the, the negotiation of settlement. So when has a message actually be consumed and when can I remove that message from my buffer and throw it away, knowing that the other party has gotten it. Those messages need to be held in buffers on either side. So as they enter the MQP stack, they need to be held in buffers until they are settled, until they have settled on, the, on one side and until settled on the other side. And the size of those buffers 
is uh, being negotiated here in the session setup, which is again, talking about IoT, very important if you have small constraint, constraint devices with very little memory that they can say, I can do this much and not more. Once the transfer windows are full, once the credit, so to speak, is, is um, uh, used up, all communication on that session stops until that window is kind of replenished with more credit, which happens through the flow construct, which we're going to talk about also uh, in the context of message transfers, because that's one construct that's being used there. So, but it's a window-based flow control model that is valid for the session. If we think back to the connection, we can have main flow, what the application is willing to handle is all, all of that is multiplex kind of on one session. And you can have a second session that has a different flow control model that may have a different buffer setup, which can be used for alerts and which can be used for kind of ex express traffic. And that's kind of why you have these flow that flow control model on the, um, underneath. So a connection can support multiple concurrent sessions. The link is uh, a named, important, the application names it, unidirectional transfer route from messages from source to a target node. Um, that session can any, a session can accommodate any number of links. They're just illusions effectively created on either side. And uh, the links in either direction can be initiated by either peer. So it's fully symmetric and each party can go and wish for new links to be created. So I can act, I can create a link as being a sender. I can create a link as being a receiver and the other party will then go and, uh, and uh, um, confirm that link by sending the attach so the, the initiator sends the attached message in one way and then uh, the reply accepting that, send, accepting that link is the attached message sent into the other direction. And what that gives you, um, what a link gives you is a transfer route for messages in one way and then a acknowledgement route kind of for messages in the other way. So that's how this position works and also how flow control works. Flow control on... Um, on um, links is separate from the window-based control. The window-based control is something that happens under the covers. The links are having a separate flow control model that's also credit-based, um, which is more for the application, more for the API shape and uh, for um, you know, modeling things like an individual receive or modeling continuous flows, which is also something that I'm gonna get to um, later. Um, and that was, uh, Kind of the foundational protocol elements and in the next session i'm going to talk about message transfers and how the message transfers happen and also talk more about the flow control model